everyone, and welcome back to the Petronauts Podcast. It is a pleasure to wish you a very happy new year, happy 2023. We have had a wild 2022, and I do not expect 2023 to be any different. A lot of the themes that were taking place over the course of 2022, which I think a lot of folks actually weren't paying deep enough attention to, are going to continue to sort of matriculate throughout 2023. But with that, this is episode 69 of the Petronauts Podcast. Welcome back again. It is uh, a pleasure to be with you, and I'm going to keep this introduction really short. We're going to be covering um, lots of stuff in depth in the next several weeks in this podcast. Um, so we're going to keep this one, uh, this intro short, because this is a, a long, longer podcast. This is a conversation that I had with the Women in Oil and Gas Association, a lunch tech talk. Um, there's some great questions. We cover everything from crypto and why oil prices are, why there's compression in oil prices that may be not reflecting fundamentals and tightening of the market and lack of liquidity in trading, all the way to some some questions on you know my business and, and how it started and, and what I'm doing. But we also talk about what's going on within Russia, what is the supply and demand fundamentals in, in oil and gas, and just sort of really, uh, it's a really nice recap, really, of what's going on over the course of 2022 um, in the crude oil space. And I will say that there were a lot of questions with regards to ESG um, and obviously politics and, and the Biden administration. And so we talk about that at length and in depth um, and, um, and obviously talk about the state of U.S. oil and gas production. So I actually want to start there. So I really hope you guys enjoy this, this conversation. It's, it's a great talk um, and really conversational. So um, you can probably put it on fast speed. Give me, I, I talk a little bit slower in that to get through it. But I, I think that starting with U.S. production, we're producing, we're going to end the year probably north of 12 and a half million barrels per day. Um, we're 12, 12.4 million barrels per day right now for U.S. oil and gas production um, as of October um, of 2022. And we are looking at, we're looking at over 121 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas in the U.S. And I'm not going to spend a, a ton of time talking about that right now because the next podcast, I'm going to be talking about U.S. shale in depth. Um, and we're going to be using the uh, the pod or the recording that I did, the presentation that I gave um, in Oxford on U.S. shale, and I'll be front loading that with a ton of updated um, information. So we'll be talking about that. But the U.S. has had significant upside growth in production, particularly in the Permian Basin, and really with regards to New Mexico, where we're seeing the state and two counties, Lee and Eddy County in New Mexico, producing one over 1.7 million barrels per day, which is just incredibly, incredibly impressive. Um, so with that backdrop, um, we obviously have a lot of production. We have Russian production that's been more resilient than expected. Um, and we've had not as much cuts on the OPEC side as expected as well. And if you uh, were following the International Energy Agency, the report or, or um, in December, or the re OPEC report from December as well, there was a lot of mixed messaging with that. And I think it's really important to timestamp this because when when I did this podcast with the Women's Oil and Gas Association and had this conversation, that was November 16th, and we are at January 5th. So right now with the timestamp, we are seeing WTI at 73.88, Brent at 78.90, um, Henry Hub has, wow, we are seeing a three-handle, 375 on Henry Hub that has really come down, and we are seeing Dutch TPF at um, 20 bucks and 27 cents. So that has really, really come off a cliff. Um, a lot of that is attributed to, to storage and um, and not less demand they they've pushed demand down and also now we're having warmer weather in europe um and then we are seeing the 30-year yield or the, sorry the 10-year yield at uh 3.735 and we are seeing the 30-year mortgage hanging around this six and a half um six and a half to 6.6 .6 mark um percent but if you're googling mortgages you can see the first thing you're going to get is north of seven percent so i think if anyone's buying a house today it's north of seven percent that's why you're not seeing houses actually move um and so if we're looking back at November 16th, we have had a walloping of loss on oil prices and net gas prices. So November 16th, WTI was 85.59, Brent was 92.86. So we are below 80 bucks for Brent right now. And I, I know, you know, last year, a lot of people had pressed me at various events. You know, I was at um, in Pittsburgh over the summer um, or actually early spring. And I know JP Morgan, Toby Rice had pushed me on stage to ask me about, you know, where oil prices were going to be because I was far more negative than a lot of the folks on stage. And um, and I said 80. And obviously we're under that. And there's a number of different reasons why we sort of got there. And obviously it could have been higher because of trading volatility or geopolitics or anything. Um, so not saying I, I, I was, uh, you know, right all year by any means. But the point is, is that the reason, um, you know, Petronerds and the reason I thought that oil prices were going to be suppressed 
this is because of the slug of really bad economic data. And I think that that economic data is holding true, right? We're seeing, you know, massive recessionary fears that are really weighing on oil prices. We're also seeing the um, the very, very messiness within China on the undoing of the sort of COVID lockdowns that's weighing on oil prices. And I think there was a, there's a lot of pent-up optimism. Everyone one wants to start betting on China. And the, uh, the rolling back of this zero COVID measures where they're sort of just letting COVID rip right now. Well, again, we'll be getting into China at great depth in later podcasts. But that is having serious implications because the folks in China have been told that, hey, COVID is really, really bad for over the course of, you know, basically the past year on this on the zero COVID lockdown. And now they're being told, hey, it's fine. Just go out and do whatever. And so people are getting COVID left, right and center. And that's really impacting the the um, the state of the economy. And we saw that really in the in the last quarter where things were suppressed and we saw bad economic data out of China. Obviously, that's weighed on oil prices. And I think the sentiment on that, not knowing what's going on within China um, and really big concerns with the global economy. And that brings us to, you know, inflation and the Fed. And so I think what we're seeing right now is a really, really mixed picture. We've had uh, gold up a little bit. We've had the dollar, um, we've had the dollar down um, yesterday. The dollar is up today because we had very positive jobs data, very, very resilient jobs data in the U.S., um, over 200,000 jobs. Now, that means that, uh, that means that if we have a resilient job market, in the face of everything going on, that means the Fed is going to have to work harder um, to fight inflation and raise interest rates. Now, the Fed, uh, the minutes came out yesterday, and they were they were pretty hawkish, meaning that they actually were telling the market, hey, be careful, because we need to keep rates higher for longer, um, and we're going to stay this course. And the market is continually trying to bake in this Fed pivot, where the Fed is going to lower interest rates over the or start cutting interest rates in 2023. And you have to be really careful with that, because in 2021, everyone would have told you that the Fed was not going to raise rates. And obviously, the Fed raised rates significantly over the course of 2022, and we're probably going to have to con- see, see continue rate hikes going forward because we have very sticky inflation in areas like rent. And that's the area where, you know, it, it's continuing to go up. And so even if inflation, as it has begun to come down in certain categories, largely due to energy prices, um, that means that it has to continue to come down. Because what's happened is the bottom half of the consumer has just been absolutely annihilated. And you heard that in uh, JP Morgan, or uh, Morgan Stanley had a, a, a conference and a uh, Walmart spoke at that conference, and you can listen to that on Seeking Alpha. It is a really frank and good conversation. And that conversation, you know, there if you're trying to get an understanding of what's happening in the top half versus what's happening in the bottom half, both are not very good. And I think there's um, some misinterpretation of what's going on when, when you're hearing, you know, oh, wage prices are going up, and that's positive for the consumer. It hasn't been really positive. That, that wage price growth that we're seeing in the bottom half of Americans for the service sector, that's eating in. So the wage prices have not, um, they, they haven't compensated for the inflation. And the reason we've had them is because of inflation. And when you have wage price spirals, that means the Fed has to work harder at combating inflation. Um, you don't want to see wages continue to go up. It's very hard to hire. It's very hard to, you know, for businesses to actually budget that and hire. And what you're actually seeing is, well, we haven't seen job layoffs on the bottom half because people are worried about getting people and we don't have enough folks in the workforce yet. And that's, I think, why we're seeing resilient jobs data. We are seeing job cuts on the top half. So if we just put this into perspective, Walmart is telling us in December, uh, the CEO w- within this Morgan Stanley event, um, this, this conference that you can listen to on Seeking Alpha and probably on their, earn- or their website as well, they're telling us about the, you know, the horrible inflation that they're seeing, particularly in areas like, you know, in food where you're seeing chicken prices up massively. Um, and if you're going to the grocery store and buying your chicken, you're, you're seeing that as well. And you're also seeing um, oh, just across the board inflation and how that's impacted durable goods. And so the CEO is explaining in that, in that, that conversation of how impacted durable goods has been and how cautious he is on the market and how they've had to do a lot of price slashing um, and how they've kept, you know, they actually took a hit and kept prices for Thanksgiving prices um, lower, they kept them at the same price it was last year and took a hit on that. And part of that's because they want to get people into the stores and they want them to buy other things. So that's a pretty big deal. Um, and and it should tell you, you know, the pain that I think the, you know, the bottom 50% of America has been feeling well over the course of 2022 and prior. And then if we flip that and we think about what's happening on the other side, if you're if you're looking at Bloomberg or CNBC, you're probably seeing things on, you know, if you're look, autos, if you're looking at the average price that people are paying on a monthly, if you're financing and buying a new car, people are paying as much as $1,000 a month. 
that is a huge price tag and a huge bill to pay each month because of higher interest rates. Um, if you've looked at your credit card, if, you, if you're not paying your credit card fully each month, the interest rates on that and the, the, um, the fees that you're getting are, are massive right now. And that that's going to will be and is weighing on consumers. And then we're seeing, we are seeing job layoffs. So we're seeing, obviously we've seen it in the mortgage space where people continue to lay off. So you see that continually in, in the mortgage sector and in housing where people are laying folks off because no one's buying homes. And so the mortgage business is, is very, very soft. But you are also seeing that now we're seeing, and obviously tech, we've talked about Apple, Google, Microsoft, all these companies that are have said, hey, we're not hiring anymore. We're having hiring freezes to the point to where uh, their extra jobs job cutting. We saw Salesforce cutting 8,000 jobs. And then last night it was leaked that it was, there were 17,000 jobs that were being cut from Amazon. Now they had said before that was 10,000. So they've obviously added to that. And then they came out last night and said that actually that was actually leaked and it's 18,000. So you have 18,000 jobs from Amazon and these are high paid. These are not, you know, some of these yes are in the warehouse and they over, you know, they, they, uh, brought on a lot of people because they were compensating from from COVID and the pent up demand and everything, and probably overdid that. And I think we're definitely seeing that on the tech side, um, but you're also seeing white collar jobs being cut. And I think when you're starting to see, you know, pieces of the economy that are hurting, you're you're seeing pain on the top half and pain on the bottom half. And I I don't think the market is fully interpreting and appreciating that. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna close and let you guys listen to this podcast. I would say. Keep paying attention to energy consumption. The, the latest two podcasts that I did with John Constable, um, uh, episodes 67 um, and 66 were fantastic. The review has been really great. And we talk about you know energy consumption in the US and abroad, especially in Europe, and what that means, um, you, the actual types of energy consumptions, what it means to have renewables pushed into the grid. And I think you're going to continue to see these themes way out. I do think ESG is seeing a lot of pressure in terms of actually an investment thesis. And I think you know the war in Ukraine is still ongoing. Um, we have seen a Europe cut back on actual crude that they're getting from um, from from Russia, but we have not seen them actually cut back on product. And so that crude has just sort of worked its way around the globe. And we have seen pretty resilient production over the course of 2022 for Russia. So some themes, and obviously we'll be talking about China. So pay attention to Russia, energy consumption, and China. And um, enjoy the podcast, folks. Uh, talk to you soon. Bye. This is uh, Trisha Kurtz. She is president and CEO of Petro Nerds, a, a company she founded almost eight years ago. Trisha is also the host of the popular and highly respected Petro Nerds podcast. Uh, you are missing out if you have not listened to her podcast. So go subscribe, take notes, learn. Um, Trisha can be described as an expert of micro and macro market intelligence and an authority on matters of geopolitics, oil and gas production, and technological change in our industry. She's globally recognized for her knowledge of US shale and unconventional oil production. Ms. Curtis has been asked to speak and present at numerous conferences and forums, including for OPEC, the Department of Defense, Exxon, BP, Oxford University, Stanford University, the Canadian Energy Research Institute, Brookings Institution, and on and on and on. Um, she was even an invest on an investor panel with the oil minister of Bahrain in the Middle East. Um, Ms. Curtis is a research associate for the Oxford Institute of Energy and has published several reports on U.S. shale production. Um, we're not done yet. Prior to Petro Nerds, Trisha was the director of research upstream and midstream at the Energy Policy Research Foundation in Washington, D.C. Here she spearheaded their contracts with the Department of Energy analyzing geopolitics, evaluating, reporting, and presenting on future North American crude oil upstream production and midstream transportation options. And she also researched China and international economics. Just a ton of impressive accomplishments you did at the um, Energy Policy Research Foundation. Trisha got her master's in international political economy from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She wrote her dissertation on Chinese national oil companies. She got her undergrad degree from Regis University here in Denver, where she double majored in economics and politics and graduated uh, summa cum laude. Trisha is a Wyoming native, but grew up in Northwest Colorado and Southwest Wyoming around the oil and gas industry, a third generation working in oil and gas industry, a third generation working in oil and gas, Petroleum might just be in Trisha's blood. 
Tricia, thank you so much for uh, volunteering your time to be here with us this afternoon um, for the Women's and Oil and Gas Association of Colorado Technical Lunch Fireside Chat. Um, we're going to kick off this fireside chat with some of Tricia's technical insights and analysis of the current and future oil and gas markets and some of the key issues affecting uh, production that we're seeing right now. And then we're going to dive a little deeper into uh, the woman behind Petro Nerds. All right, there is so much happening in the world right now. Um, just to name a few, I mean, the midterm elections, um, inflation is up, mortgage rates are rising, um, there's recession fears, uh, some recent tech layoffs in the tech industry with Amazon and Twitter, we've got our ongoing war with uh, Russia and Ukraine, um, China is still dealing with strict COVID shutdowns and there's lots of discussion about the net zero goals and um, climate concerns. Those are being discussed right now at the UN Climate Change Conference. Um, it is hard to figure out where to start and I am fascinated by the work you do because there's so many of these factors, variables, metrics that you look at and analyze to make your forecasts and predictions on the oil and gas market. Um, I was thinking of starting with, you know, we can see the increase at prices at the pump. Um, prices in stocks and oil and gas are going up as well. Um, 2022 has been a profitable year for a lot of operators, um, but yet uh, production is, is still kind of stagnant and it's not keeping up with the demand. There seems to be a big demand that's still there. I hear conflict about that as well. Like why is not our production ramping up um, to meet the need of the demand? Um, what's going on behind that? Yeah, so um, thank you very much. And those were exceptionally kind words and thank you for being here today. Um, so I think firstly, uh, production is ramping up. So I think there's a, you know, energy illiteracy in this country and around the world is huge. Um, so I spend a lot of time speaking with a lot of different folks and love that the podcast is sort of an outlet to talk to people about just energy in general, but more so when I was in DC last week and we were speaking about this on a, on a panel. And I think, you know, how many people understand that the US is the largest oil and gas producer in the world? It, it's, it's not as many as you think. Um, and so we talked about, you know, even in the International Energy Agency, they'll put out their, they just put out the report this uh, yet, two days ago, and it showed, you know, the big three oil producers. And I mean, the massive, the gap in, in how much we produce versus Saudi Arabia and Russia is significant, inter especially when you include liquid. So firstly, I would say that US oil production right now is about 12 million barrels per day. So that's 1 million barrels per day off of the high that we had in 2019 of about 13 million barrels per day. So we have climbed our way back and you can see a massive drop in production and then this steady ramp up back. Now at these oil prices and when we saw a peak of, you know, $140 oil prices, which wasn't reality, but that was just you know, war fears and trading, you know, we saw obviously, you know, strong and healthy oil prices. So there, there's a lot that's pretty profitable in America right now to drill for. And we see that if you're looking at the, the slug of operators, I mean, if you break out the public private operators and you see, you know, 400 rigs of private companies and 300 plus rigs of, of public companies and private operators have sort of dominated, they are poking a lot of holes in the ground. Uh, Chris Wright was just on CNBC yesterday and he did a great job of sort of explaining, you know, why are, how come we haven't seen a, a quicker ramp up in production? And I would say, you know, we have seen this steady ramp up in production, especially if we're gonna, you know, as of August data, we're at 12 million barrels per day. You know, last year, my predictions were that we would easily clear the year at 12 million barrels per day. And there were plenty of people that pushed back on that. Um, so I think, you know, ConocoPhillips came out with their earnings. They recently, they, they've been sort of iffy in, in, you know, where would it be at for production, but less about productivity and more about, um, in terms of how the well performance is and more about just activity. So how many rigs can you get back? And really the labor shortages that we see across America, across the entire world, um, a lot of it due to fiscal lags and significant economic stimulus during COVID is impacting the industry significantly. So the ability to get truck drivers to, you know, haul your frac sand, to haul your water, um, to actually efficiently have your operations, have people to have rig hands. I mean, it, there's a severe shortage of labor everywhere. And in America, we still have roughly two job openings for every one applicant. And that is, you know, everything's completely out of whack there where the Fed is trying to raise interest rates and get that in line. Um, but it's definitely impacting this industry in terms of how, if we were to, you know, 
Biden administration loves to get on TV and say, you know, the industry needs to start producing more and send, giving profits back to the consumers. Well, you know, the industry is working pretty hard at, at drilling these wells. And I mean, look at how many frack fleets that Liberty has and Halliburton has, and everybody's out there drilling and fracking these wells. Uh, but there's tightness and there's uh, inflation is a big deal in terms of, you know, we see inflation at the grocery store and at the pump, but it also is impacting the actual oil and gas business of drilling and operating these wells as the engineers and, and folks in these businesses, you guys in the room know this, if you're buying pipe, if you're trying to get frack sand, if you're trying to get anything, the cost of everything is significantly higher. And then if you can't get the people, everything gets tight. And so, you know, you're on the side of I want it and the folks on the other side are on the side of you need it. And so the price goes up and, and everything gets messy. And that's definitely impacting. You've, we heard from a slug of operators throughout the third quarter earnings season and all of them cited inflation being a significant issue. And so we had even operators allocating several hundred you know, um, million just toward inflationary reasons of why their CapEx was increasing. Um, I would say there's some dis, disinformation. Wall Street Journal came out with an article that was pretty, seemed a little negative, and they, they tend to be, I mean, the stuff out of New York tends to be pretty negative on U.S. shale in just the, in terms of productivity. Um, and I would say that they, they didn't get that quite right. I was going through the wells, and if you look at, you know, ConocoPhillips, um, you can actually see that their breakdown, and they cited them in the article, so it's worth, it's worth taking a look at. So the breakdown, if you look at their well performance, say in the Delaware Basin, um, yeah, their year-over-year -year well performance is slightly down, but if you actually look at their gas performance, it's way, way up. So if you take it on a barrel of oil equivalent basis, which I don't love to do, I like to separate both, the wells are outperforming. And that's because Conoco has decided to target more gassy areas. Um, they get some gas drive, so they bring that oil with it, but also gas prices are great. Um, so we have a very unique, very, very unique environment across the world from, you know, as you pointed out really well, unprecedented economic and geopolitical complexities, but it also makes it very unique in the oil and gas field as well, in terms of the inflation, in terms of um, the high price of oil, but also the high price of gas. I mean, we haven't seen decent gas prices in since the shale revolution started. Um, so now we see them. And so looking individual operator behavior, which I used to tell people for years is really what you have to do. Um, if you look at Pioneer's natural resources call, you know, it wasn't great. Um, it was uh, they're a little heavy on the ESG side, in my opinion, um, but they also had pretty bad well. Per their well performance was not great, and so they had to. Sh they showed that in a couple slides. You know, year over year well performance was down. You know, clearly they whether it's spacing or longer laterals, you name it. Um, and you can see this that everybody's drilling longer laterals. I mean, that's why we don't have to have as many rigs as we needed before. And we basically have as many rigs as we had before. So we're doing a lot more with less. And so we, and we do have a lot of wells that have not been completed. And I know that uh, people talk about our duck count has gone down, our drilled bond completed well count has gone down, but really those are not, you know, 20 ducks that you just keep in your portfolio that you want to, you know, frack next year. This is just, we drilled the wells, we're waiting on the frack fleets, and this is a function of the industry, it's changed a lot. Um, so we have to think about, I always you know, show the duck map of the public and private operators, and this is how many wells are being poked in the ground. And it's really impressive to see how many private operators have drilled holes, not in the areas that public operators have. And that's significant. And yes, those might not be as quite as good of rock, you know, spacing hasn't been completely delineated, but this is a pretty long game in this business, getting as much as we can out of this rock. We, I think we're still in the pretty early innings, you know, I, I would, it's, if, it, if it's a nine inning game, you know, I'd say we might go into, um, you know, we, we might have a couple more innings uh, for sure after those nine innings. Um, but I would say this is also a, I mean, we're not certainly in the first couple innings, but we're not done with it either. This is not the ninth inning. Um, and if, if that's the case, then we're going to go to 10 and 11 because the rock has a lot more left to give. So with that, I just think people have to, we sort of have to caveat every time we get an earnings season and we see this data. And most earnings calls now don't, don't talk enough about the technical side anymore. They don't talk about production as much. So everybody's sort of holding, you'll hear single digit growth, holding production relatively flat or growing a little bit. Um, talking about inflation, um, but I, you know, look at Diamondback and look at their well performance and, you know, look at the average lateral lengths and then just look at, you know, they seem to be doing a little better now. Maybe they're spacing slightly wider. I mean, there's tinkering, but the point is, is, is overall, you know, 12 million barrels per day and the Permian north 5 million barrels per day, we've clawed back a lot. Um, and we've done it in the face of inflation, in the face of a, you know, a pretty negative, a very, very negative regulatory environment, meaning, you know, saying, hey, we're not really open for business for oil and gas, even though we're producing it. Um, and I think that's something really, really big to point out is that 
Um, you know, you can't actually ask operators to be drilling and producing more unless you were to make some changes like, hey, you know, I mean, unemployment increasing and having more people to work in the oil field, that's going to happen. I, it, it's sad to say for unemployment, it's, it's good for this business, it's actually good for the people who are eventually gonna lose their jobs, but as unemployment rises, this industry is probably gonna be one of those industries that are hiring. That's gonna be good from an inflationary standpoint, from a tightness standpoint, from labor. I know a lot of folks don't believe me on that, but trust me, it is coming. I, we can back up on the global oil demand side. So we're still about 100 million barrels a day of demand. I mean, OPEC came out with a report, which was negative. So oil prices came down this week because of that report saying, you know, deterioration in the, in the macroeconomic global economy, um, China COVID shutdowns, um, IEA came out with a report. We're basically at this, everybody's sort of revising their, their demand growth outlook. And it's always that growth. So when people talk about it's production growth, is, are the operators growing production? I mean, everybody's hold, we're holding production, you know, flattish, you know, a lot of these operators are. It's, are they growing production? And are we growing demand? And growing demand equates to higher oil prices and growing production equates to lower oil prices, actually. So, I mean, it's, it's always about the, you know, that margin. And we're always, we're always hanging around this 100 million barrels a day for demand and supply. And so if we drop that supply to 98 million barrels per day, we're gonna be tight. If we drop that demand to 98 million barrels per day, we don't need to worry about supply so much. And so we're kind of in that, in that we, we've been in that place for a while, but we have all this geopolitical risk that's baked onto those oil prices as well. So, and we've had very significantly reduced trading volume in oil that has really exacerbated the moves in oil because we have less liquidity, we have less money and less traders actually moving the price of oil. And that I think is something that has not been well appreciated by this market of you know what is actually happening with with oil prices and you know is it reflecting fundamentals and then when you have this geopolitical risk and you have a war going on and you have you know everyone saying they're not buying Russian oil but they actually are still buying Russian oil it gets very confusing um, and so it's it just the actual you know what people see and what they do are, are two very different things and so when it comes to these operators you know I think the art so the article is frackers say oil production slowing in the shale patch so it's just funny um, that they call them frackers because I would say, you know, Halliburton and Liberty frackers, but anyways, um, you know, so they're talking about these operators and they're basically saying, hey, you know, these guys are slowing production. They didn't say they're slowing production. They said they're not, you know, they're keeping oil production flat-ish or growing the single digits. They talked about inflation and everything. So basically they took the negative and they sort of put it out. Um, I popped a couple of emails off to people, off the companies, and they completely disagreed with the articles, the companies that were cited within the article. So, I mean, it's, it, and so I, you know, I pulled up Inveris data, which I have to, you know, pay for and subscribe to, and I looked at the actual production. Um, and so you can look at, and you can see it through their earnings call. You can actually pull up their earnings calls and look at their slides and, you know, actually look at their production data. It takes a little work doing that, but you can see it. Um, I would say, but if you, EOG resources, for example, if you pull up their production, and I'm not giving investment advice um, to anyone at all in any of these, these companies, but if you pull EOG resources and you look at actually their production, they're declining or flattish for all their basins, except for the Permian. And the Delaware Basin is just off to the races. So there's where you know the Delaware is growing, but the other basins are declining or they're just not putting the activity. So it's all a matter of sort of you know where we're doing this. But if we went from 13 million barrels per day to 11 million barrels per day, and now we're back to 12 million barrels per day, we are growing production. Um, it's just a matter of how you're seeing this and you're drilling and completing these wells and we're bringing them on. So I think that that is something, um, and I love it because it's something no one's paid attention to in a long time is, you know, where are we poking these holes? What's the actual production? Which reservoirs are we in? And I think the conversations about spacing and technical parts of this business are becoming a little more valid now, um, especially if this is being highlighted in earnings calls and, and Pioneer saying, hey, we got to readjust this. Um, it means that make, making the most of what we have in the resources. Right. As well. And it means that uh, we got it's we have a lot more to go, a lot of a lot of room to give. So I'm not worried about the technical capacity of the rock to give us a lot more. Yep. I mean, that's a really interesting. Do you have any stats on how much we have if we really wanted to become, you know, energy independent and, and open up the floodgates for uh, natural gas production? Yeah, so we, um, so for oil, it's slightly different. I mean, we consume more than we produce, so we still import some, but we also export a lot. So that's why I say, you know, we are a major oil and gas powerhouse. We actually export more than Saudi Arabia in terms of the total, total product in terms of, with natural gas liquids and crude oil. Um, so we produce 12 million barrels per day. Saudi Arabia is producing 
under 11 million barrels per day, or were they were just about to hit that 11 million barrel per day mark, and in Russia producing about 10 and a half million barrels per day, and they're set to decline a little bit because of their uh, because of the OPEC plus cuts, which Saudi and Arabia and Russia will take the brunt of. Russia was probably already declining, so that's baked in. Um, but if you think about that 12 million barrels per day and your question of this energy independence. Um, it's really, you know, how long can you sustain that production? How far can you grow? And I do think there's a lot left to give in the rock. All the things that we talked about just a minute ago on labor shortages and tightness in the market and everything, those are probably, you know, are real, real factors. But when it comes to natural gas, that is a smaller molecule. It is very easy to get it out of the ground. We absolutely know how to do that. I am 100% confident in saying, you know, we can produce way more than we have and we can do it probably for a very, very, very long time. Um, we're talking decades and decades and decades. We have we have trillions of cubic feet per day of gas or of cubic of gas in in reserves. I don't even you know I used to get asked about reserves a lot. I could care. I mean operators. No one cares about reserves. They care about you know production and capacity. And we always know that those reserves increase year over year because of technological growth. But when it comes to gas, we and this is something I, I've. It, I encourage people to really understand that market as well, of that, you know, a lot of folks kind of understand the oil market of this 100 million barrel a day supply and demand. Gas is a 400 billion cubic feet per day market globally. We produce and consume roughly 400 BCF a day. We in the U.S., our gross withdrawals right now are 120 BCF a day. So we produce more than a quarter of the world's supply of natural gas. That is nearly double what Russia produced in 2021. So when people talk about the oil and gas powerhouse of the world, especially the natural gas powerhouse, we are producing nearly double of Russia. They produced 68 BCF a day last year. So when we talk about the geopolitics and, and supply and demand and who has the power, energy is power and it is leverage. And we have it, we're just not deploying it. So if we were to ramp up LNG export facilities, as in permitting them and actually building them, and don't tell me we can't do that, it is completely possible to expedite those permits. It's also possible to get people, you know, use wartime power acts to actually build these facilities and get this, this exported. But we have some issues with that because Europe is, you know, Europe did get, you know, hand off their energy security and their geopolitical power and leverage to Russia on a silver platter. And this has been really complicated because they also, I mean, this is kind of in the name, I mean, is in the name of very, very aggressive green policies, you know, wanting to reduce their CO2 emissions and just pretending that, you know, they'll figure out a way to, um, you know, solve for the natural gas problem. So they'll just let Russia, they'll bring in all the natural gas from Russia and then they'll just solve for it, um, not using it later. So what happened was if you look at that production and, and consumption of natural gas for Europe, it's a really bad chart. It's the like not to do chart of it for everyone. And it's consumption is like this. So they're 55 BCF a day of consumption and production is like this. For the last 10 years, they've just been going on this, this trajectory up in consumption, down in production. They produce only 20 BCF a day of gas. So that gap is massive and that's largely, was largely filled with Russian imports. And their Russian imports, their exposure was nearly, nearly two BCF a day was liquefied natural gas imports, LNG imports from Russia, which by the way, have not gone away. They're still, they're still bringing that in. The pipeline imports, they would have continued to take those pipeline imports. The only reason they're not taking them is because Russia shut off the damn pipeline. Um, so they were getting about 16 BCF a day of gas from Russia via pipeline. And so we, they shut off you know, Nord Stream 1. They never flowed Nord Stream 2. So it's really a situation where you have, Russia had maximum leverage on, on Europe. And it's not about the money for them. I mean, this is a very long game. This is a long war. This is uh, very intentional, very methodical. And so they've had years of this leverage building up. And so, yes, they get money from natural gas, but not as much money as they get from oil. And those oil imports from Russia have not gone down really, but they've gone down by a little bit. Um, we even see imports into China, which is another big thing that's extremely related, which we can talk about, but imports of natural gas into China from Russia have increased by a third over the course of this war. Um, and they have actually taken volumes of that gas and they've rerouted it and they've sent it to Europe. So Russian volumes of natural gas go to China and then China sends it back to Europe. And who makes the money? China. And who makes money? Russia. And who is funding the war in Russia? China. So, you know, when Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, goes over to China just a week or so ago and visits them and brings 12 CEOs with them, it's a really, really big deal because Germany was the one that got Europe into this mess 
of you know giving all their energy security away to Russia, and now they're walking you know into into China and saying, okay, well, we're ready to do business with you because our economy is hurting so bad. We're ready to double down on another autocratic leader who you know is not going to be good for us, and is probably we're probably going to all end up in World War III together. But we're okay with this, and it is ridiculous that people have not really called them out on this. I mean, the people in their country are, um, it, but it's it's a very, very serious issue. So sorry, that was a bit of a rant. That's all right. I, I feel your yeah. passion. Yeah. And um, it, um, I want it, before I, I've got some more questions, but anybody else has got, has any of this sparked any um, follow-up questions or comments? Patricia? From my experience over the past, this year in particular, we have so many work and that directly contributed into the lower and you know behind the production and we have to play a lot more catch up. So what are your comments on that? Like how the whole thing will because it should well it should last between twenty to thirty years and now we're seeing that like before we even produce the oil. So that's the risk. And it's gonna maybe put the bad taste in the you know publicity about the environmental responsibility and whatnot. So is there any like channel or talking discussion on that regards to it? The pipe quantity, the well bore integrity issue? Um, so I think uh, you're quite, I mean, largely around well bore integrity, I mean, it's a huge issue. It's, it's very valid. Um, it's not something being talked about, I think, in the public space. Lar I mean, it's not something that you're hearing it within public operators and earnings calls. However, given that most of the activity, you know, in most of the, the majority or, or more than half of the drilling is being done by private operators. Um, I would say that, you know, it, it, well bore integrity is a super, is a big issue. I would guess that, um, you know, off the top of my head without knowing it intimately, is that longer laterals, um, every time we have a drop in, in oil prices and we have a shift in the market, the industry shifts and they try to react to it. So one of the abilities, I mean, to save costs and money and you have inflation is longer laterals are an answer. They were an answer before because you just have less stuff on the surface. And even if you're declining your productivity a little bit, you know, as long as you're not seeing massive diminishing marginal returns and you're, you're in a put for production, you know, might as well go longer. And so we, we have seen, you know, average lateral lengths for operators are 12,000 feet. We're hearing a lot about 15,000 foot laterals and even farther than that. So naturally with that, you know, years ago, when you talk to operators, you know, they were pretty hesitant on 15,000 foot laterals for a number of different reasons. Uh, part of it was because they just didn't think they could complete the end of the well as good. Um, and so naturally, I think that people have, we've sort of said, oh yeah, the public operators said this is great and we're doing just fine. But clearly, you know, if you're drilling a three mile long lateral, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot that goes with that. And so I would say, I wouldn't say overwhelmingly, there's a well-born integrity issue, but I think that the need, the, an appreciation need to continue to focus on what's going on with those wells and how we're producing. And if, if people are doing things really fast or, you know, and you're not, you know, slowing down and paying attention to, you know, cementing and pipe and everything, I mean, yeah, I could, I could absolutely imagine um, that some, you know, operators, public or private, um, could have some issues where if you're doing things way too fast, you're not paying, you're not slowing things down and you're focused on cost and, you know, and we can, folks can make mistakes. Um, and that's, that's something industry has to be very, very careful of, of not doing that because, you know, in Colorado, we saw that in, you know, when production, when prices came down and everybody was very, very focused on lowering costs and safety was not exactly a high priority. And um, we had, you know, we had a bunch of vertical wells shut in and then we had the Firestone ex explosion because we had that well turned on and that was a, a cut pipe and a pressure test wasn't run and that didn't, you know, that was something preventable, but it wasn't prevented. And so those are one of the things that as the industry continues to evolve, it's incredibly important to pay attention to that. So I don't have a good answer for you. I'm not intimately familiar with it, um, but I'm happy to follow it up with you. Can you expand a little bit on um, kind of the decline in trade volumes and just overall liquidity and do you think that's just due to the volatility or kind of what do you think is the reason behind that? Uh, so there are a lot of reasons and it's a great question. It's it's extremely important. I think even something is, um, you know, this morning Target had their earnings call, which was really, really bad. Um, I haven't finished it, but listen to the seven minutes and it tells you a lot about the world. Walmart had their earnings call yesterday, which is really good. That should also tell you about the world. When Walmart's doing well, the economy is not doing well. When Target's not doing well, the economy is not doing well. Um, so. That aside, um, you know, crypto, we've seen a massive crash in crypto. We have uh, these exchanges that are falling apart. All this has a lot, it, 
they're way more interrelated than anyone sort of on TV or the stock market or these analysts tell you because if you're trading these volumes, um, if, trading anything, whether it's stocks or crypto or nickel, they're interrelated. And um, you know, we see the market, the stock market bounce in these, we're, we're in a bear market. And so we see declines and you see you know, an up day, but then it comes down and an up day and then it comes down. Well, the problem is that you know we have these short coverings, so people are covering their shorts, so then you have an update, and we, we've seen that in the last uh, in the last week or so with with this these thinking there's going to be a Fed pivot. But every time you have that, money has to move around, and I think we've seen over the course of the last two years a lot of money pull out of oil and gas, um, and particularly in you know there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think there's the big ESG movement, the you know anti oil and gas movement, the you know really methodical efforts to you know pull money from investors pulling money out of the oil and gas space because they don't like it um, and they're worried about you know the future. There, there's a piece, but that doesn't really that's more like the stocks of you know an Exxon and the EOG and a Pioneer. There's less about you know what's the traded volumes of oil and gas and and particularly oil in the contracted volumes and you can see a considerable decline over 2020 to 20 to now of how those have really come off. And so when you have thinner traded volumes, your volatility is going to increase. Um, if you go on CME Group or any of those, you know, type in you know, WTI futures, you can see that the future volumes, future contracted volumes are extremely thin in that forward curve. So anyone talking about strip prices is just, you know, great. That's, that's, that's what we think of prices today, but it will change tomorrow and those traded volumes are really thin. Um, so that, you know, the nickel London Metals Exchange um, had, we saw over the summer, crazy volatility in nickel because we had the biggest producer of nickel in Indonesia was actually like shorting nickel because they thought that they were going to produce a lot. So they decided to short it. This created problems. They created big problems for the London Metals Exchange because they didn't know who was on the other side of that trade. They shut down trading. Well, that was a liquidity issue and that pulled money out of, if people have to cover shorts or any, any says these bets, if, if, same for stocks. So if, if stocks go up and down, people are pulling money out of oil. Um, traders are pulling money out of oil. Now that, that's been happening for a while because you know, people got burned on oil um, and you just, that's been happening over, over time. Um, for the last 10 years because people, lots of traders have been burned on it. But anytime we have volatility in all these other spaces, um, and hedge funds pulling out, it just exacerbates it. And a lot of oil is traded algorithmically, meaning computers are, are reading the news and then trading this, and so you can have these swings. But I do think these swings seem to be exacerbated by the fact that you don't have humans trading it, and um, a lot of folks not knowing exactly the supply-demand fundamentals, um, and, and then we're always backward looking in, in terms of demand, like we don't actually know. So it, everything is sort of lagging. And so to look back and so all that matters a ton. And when we're not, um, when we think about these thin, thinly traded volumes and these prices, we have to start asking ourselves, is this reflecting supply and demand? And um, I think that that's just extremely important to pay attention to. Um, and the fact that, you know, you could have $140 a barrel from, you know, at the beginning of this year when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, that was just not reality. I mean, we didn't lose supply. We just, that was just fear driven and, and traders doing that. Um, but then if you had somebody on the other side of that trade, they would have to cover that. And anytime, so we have these crises um, and crypto would be a big one that, uh, you know, if we have more money and more to pull out of this, people are just gonna be pulling out of the market in general. And I think that's, that's super serious. And um, you can look back to the 70s where we had you know, the two big price shocks. We weren't really tra we weren't trading oil then. I mean, it wasn't until the 80s that we commoditized oil and that changed a lot for OPEC because they didn't have nearly as much control on the market because this became a, a traded commodity. And so now I think we're going through an inflection point. And, and truthfully, I have not heard a lot of folks really get into this and talk about it. Um, it's just something you can see. You can look at it and say, you know, something's really going on here, and it's it's definitely something to pay attention to. So midterm elections, mm -hmm. a big conversation right now. Um, the Democrats are keeping the Senate, and it looks like the Republicans are probably going to have the House. Um, I know you 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 have shared and you have um, particular feelings about the Biden administration and their stance on oil and gas. Um, but for those of those of us who maybe not been listening to the Petro Nerds podcast. Um, can you share a little bit more about how um, how are our current administration's policies affecting the market and, and uh, natural gas production? Yeah, so I think um, you know, th and this gets back to your other question that maybe didn't we didn't conclude very well. 
um, or I didn't conclude very well, but um, so for natural gas production, um, you know, we can increase it technically. We know that we can, we can small mo molecule, put a bunch of frac sand down. We, we know how to do this. We know how to use wells. We are limited by pipeline capacity. We've canceled about 7 billion cubic feet per day of pipeline capacity um, over the last several years. Um, so that's, re that's very critical to think about. We just don't have enough pipeline capacity. So we're kind of maxed out in terms of Marcellus production. In terms of growth, we're not going to see much coming from Marcellus because we don't have the past pipeline capacity to move it. So that's a significant issue. And we haven't built a new pipeline um, in several years. So that's a big issue for oil and natural gas. There's full stop. Um, and that's multiple under multiple presidencies that's taken place. Started really with Obama, um, but it's in, and you know Trump wasn't able to get Keystone XL built. Um, it was permitted, largely most of it was built. We have a very small bit to actually build on this, and then um, and now we have uh, Biden who you know canceled Keystone XL. So I, I think um, it, it's it's very important to realize how much policies and how much uh, rhetoric um, does move the needle for uh, for investment. So it doesn't matter what, what business you're in, um, you need stability and predictability. So it doesn't matter if we're building, um, you know, widgets for our iPhones. Um, if, you know, a policy comes out that is negative or uncertain on the widgets for the iPhones, whether it's demand or supply or anything, we're not going to be able to build, you know, put the, invest the money to build those widgets. And the same goes for oil and gas and, and literally any business is that when we, and we've, this is so unprecedented because we've, as the largest producer of oil and gas in the world, it's pretty serious when the administration, when the president of the United States is constantly getting on TV and ripping on the oil and gas industry. And from the first day, canceling Keystone XL, that's a statement to the industry on the campaign trail said he wanted to ban fracking and was very anti-oil and gas. Um, you know, the media said, oh, he's a moderate and that he clarified that he wasn't a moderate and he wanted to ban oil and gas production. Um, you know, then they, you know, canceled Keystone XL on day one. They also banned federal permits on day one um, through a two month moratorium. And that was a really significant deal because that was a signal to the industry of, hey, you know, and it was a total 100% political move. I mean, political analysts will tell you this, this is not me. This was a, the acting Secretary of Interior, we didn't even have a Secretary of Interior at the time, you know, puts this order out to ban federal permits. It was not legal on Indian lands, but they tried to do that on tribal lands. It, they had no basis for, they had no legal balance for doing that, but they did it anyway. Um, and so it was completely political to try to get people to do things that they wanted to do within Congress. Um, anyways, they lifted the ban on permitting within two months, and we have seen permitting come back a little bit. But it's sort of like this, the decline of permitting from, you know, under Trump increased significantly because people knew if Biden got elected, they weren't going to get a permit. And now it's just, they're just not permitting very much. And so you, if you turn on the TV, I don't watch, you know, Fox or CNN, so I don't actually know. But I hear from people that, you know, if you turn on the TV, you hear, oh, but you have 9,000 permits. And how come you're not drilling those 9,000 permits? You know, if you would just get back to work and drill those 9,000 permits. Well, as third generation oil and gas, I can tell you that it just doesn't work that way. One, it is a boom and bust business. So we've dealt with a lot of volatility in the last several years. Um, and everybody wants everybody to drill now because oil prices are high, but they sure as hell didn't care when oil prices were low and everybody was losing their jobs, including myself. You know, the uh, you know, administration, nobody was around for that either, you know, trying to lend a helping hand to the industry. Um, and so this, this negative sentiment on, hey, we're gonna cast, cancel Keystone XL, we're rejoining the Paris Climate Accords, these are, um, you know, Janet Yellen with the secretary, you know, the SEC, all this stuff is really impactful because it's a momentum shift of signaling from the White House um, and regulations into investors. And so investors saying, okay, this is a signal. We do need to start pulling out of oil and gas. And so that means the oil and gas operators, the public ones are working really hard to keep the long, you know, be in a long only portfolio and sell their story. And they've, you know, they've gone all on this net zero bandwagon, which I very much disagree with. Um, and so it's, it's, it's all, it's really crazy though in terms of, I, I say it a lot, but I, I can't get it. I heart net zero is basically just every oil company just jumped on the bandwagon. You know, I've had ConocoPhillips on the podcast. I criticize them for that publicly, you know, and they're all great with it because they think it's, it's beneficial to them in these portfolios and they're doing the right thing. They're not really impacting, you know, significantly impacting CO2 emissions on a global basis. So I don't, I don't think we're doing much here other than making, trying to make people feel better. Um, so can you can you so, tell us more about when you say you don't think it's really affecting global emissions? Um, 
Why? Why is that? Because U.S. oil production is 1% of U.S. CO2 emissions. So um, we can drop our emissions to zero and it's still going to be 1%. So CO2 emissions are largely, I mean, they come from industry, they come from cement, they come from, you know, the when you refine the barrel of crude oil and then you put it in your car as gasoline and then you burn it, you get emissions from that. So unless you're targeting, unless you're shutting down the ability for people to drive, which happened during COVID and people stopped driving, and we saw a drop in emissions, that's where a lot of this was propelled from. Is oh, look at this, wow, we lost 8 million barrels of AA demand and nobody was driving and, and look, and our, our skies got greener and people lost their jobs and people died and that was really significant and the economy tanked. But hey, we, we dropped emissions. And that's really what the International Energy Agency and you know um, and the UN and, and all these reports, that's sort of what they are echoing is, is, mm -hmm. is that. But the point of, of you know this administration the, the negativity or the anti-oil and gas. We, we've never had a U.S. president this anti-domestic oil and gas, full stop. Just, it's never happened. And dipping into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to the extent that they have is a really, really serious issue because we have an ongoing war in Ukraine um, and we have potential, you know, we, we're talking about Taiwan, whether or not that happens, but it doesn't matter. You, you keep an SPR because you have cover for your demand. Um, and so it's a serious issue that we've dipped into this piggy bank and we have 10 days less. We had about 30 days of supply in that SPR. We have 10 days less than we did before. Um, and we continue to sell that off, um, largely for political reasons. You're only supposed to dip into it you know, for, you know, if you actually need it, not to lower oil prices. Um, so you have that and you have a, and then you have these talkings, um, you know, from certainly people in Congress are talking about windfall taxes, but you have the administration not alluding to windfall taxes. You have real talk in the administration about um, export bans. So not allowing re or reducing or not allowing the exports of liquefied natural gas to lower the prices of natural gas domestically and also gasoline and diesel because we do export a significant amount of refined you know, product, which is diesel and gasoline. We export a significant amount of natural gas liquids in the form of propane um, and other natural gas liquids. So huge, huge volumes, um, which yes, you could, we would tank the market. You could certainly do, I mean, but it's really messy. So when you're, when you're alluding to a windfall tax, so you're literally telling operators, hey, produce more and drill more. And why aren't you drilling and producing more? And largely that's because they, you know, can't get the people and, and we, you know, it's, it's a people and inflationary issue. Um, but even if we said, you know, go out and do it, um, the worry is that they're going to get taxed later and they're going to have a windfall tax. And so you have to have that sort of certainty. Um, and I think the industry has been really slow on the uptake of pushing back on this administration. Um, we're starting to see it. We're starting to see a little more clear talking from companies like Exxon, but it's taken nearly two years and a lot of beating and berating and letters from the administration going to these oil companies for the oil companies to start pushing back and say, hey, actually, we're, we, you know, we're doing this, we're trying to increase our output. Um, but the lost refining capacity is such a significant, not well understood issue. We've lost over a million barrels of a refining capacity in this country largely due to COVID and very bad economics from refineries, largely in California, also severely, you know, very anti oil and gas regulations. Um, so that lost refining capacity and lost global refining capacity, lost global refined product out of China, out of Russia is, re, um, you know, strikes and, and outages and stuff going on within Europe and um, union issues and people wanting more pay and inflation going on with Total in France, all that is impacting diesel. And so we are, we still demand diesel and we're, um, we don't have enough diesel. And that's why you see gasoline prices pretty low, you know, in the three-ish range at the pump, but you see diesel prices at five bucks. And that's because we, we just are refined product. When we refine this barrel of crude oil, we don't get exactly what we want. You know, we get diesel and we get gasoline um, and we don't have enough diesel right now. And so it's, globally, that's an issue. The economy slowing is probably gonna to begin to um, help that a little bit. That's not a good thing, but that's just kind of a reality. And then building back refining capacity is also helping with that. So it sounds like a lot is hinging on, people aren't realizing if you wanna protect the environment, you know, here's where the regulations are. Don't, don't send it over to China to have China make it and, and send it back to us. We can do it right here. Um, what, um, how do how do we get to that point? Is there anything anything we can do to help get get to that point to to get the infrastructure built and have more assurances? Yes, um, I do think there is, and I just I just had Toby Rice with EQT on the podcast, and and we we really do disagree. He thinks we don't, but we do disagree, in, in terms of the crux of the core of this problem, which 
he thinks is CO2 and he's a publicly traded company. So he's, you know, has his right to his statements, but you know, it's not about CO2. It's just not about, this is not about emissions. So I think for years I've, I've kind of, you know, battled with a lot of industry leaders and, and governors in the state, um, you know, directly and been very forward with them of, um, that we're just not focusing on the right things. And, you know, there's been a back and forth about, you know, whether we not education works. And I don't really think education worked well in the state, especially if it's coming out, no offense to, to COGA or API, organiza great organizations, but these are lobbying organizations. And so when they're saying something, no, immediately people are just turned off from it. So the industry has not done a good job of educating and advocating for themselves. Full stop, they just haven't. Um, they don't fund independent organizations. I worked at one at Brink. It, it was very hard to get funding. So the industry talks big about this stuff, but they need to write checks. They need to actually, and they need to fund it within their companies. And they need to, um, you, you know, signing up for the iHeart Net Zero and promoting this and literally, you know, going along the trend of the International Energy Agency. The net zero thing is net zero by 2050, which net zero by 2050 is we have to reduce oil demand from 100 million barrels a day right now to 75 million barrels a day eight years from now. Eight years from now. So 25 million barrel drop off, that's that's a COVID every year. That's shutting down your economy. It's 100% it's not going to happen. It's not happening. Um, so it's one, it's being honest. And Chris Wright is one of the few companies that will say, we're actually not in an energy transition. We're not adding a bunch of wind and solar in China in tandem with coal. It's not an energy transition. Buying a bunch of solar, you know, that Germany is buying from China. It's not an energy transition. It's made from coal. It's made from forced labor. It's just adding a bunch of solar. It doesn't make your grid more reliable. Um, so it's, it's, you know, yes, they, they've added wind and solar in Europe. Um, they didn't, their emissions are pretty low to begin with. So, you know, it, it's sort of on the margins. You know, we as a country are, are you know, if, if we were to do what the administration wants us to do with the climate change executive order, um, which again was within a week of the administration, that would mean that we would have to sort of, you know, blanket America with wind and solar panels. And that doesn't even account for building the transmission lines, which we don't have the legal code to actually do. Um, you would have to have them in a domain. You would have to uproot people from their homes. I mean, it's a free country. Um, we're, it's, it's just not happening. Um, so it's very problematic. And that wind and solar does come from China. Um, it is very expensive. I mean, they've dropped the prices because they're not paying people. They're using forced labor to do it. Um, but it's 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 has not made money to date. I mean, wind and solar projects have not made money to date. Um, and when you have rising inflation, and unfortunately, this has hit you know the, the wonderful people in the wind and solar industry, and there are actually very good people in the wind and solar industry that I know. Um, but I, I'm not a fan of of the businesses in general, um, and I'm okay saying that. They're not profitable. Um, they were subsidized heavily. And so inflation is a big problem for them, as it is across for every business, as we've talked about. Every Our businesses, you know, the dentists, everyone is impacted by inflation. But particularly wind and solar and renewables and green tech had this big tailwind with, with this administration, with the, you know, uh, resigning the Paris Climate Accords and with when you have low inflation and low interest rates, it's great for green tech because it's easy money. Just like, you know, when we had low interest rates, it's great for the oil business had easy money too. And, you know, we had some problems in the oil business and, and green tech about, is about ready to have those problems is because you, that easy money, you can't now higher interest rates because we're fighting off inflation. You have higher interest rates and that's impacting the ability to actually fund these projects. And these projects are, you know, based on, you know, very heavily subsidized, you know, incentives from the government. So it gets really, really complicated in that space. So to answer your question, energy or energy literacy, explaining energy, having people understand, you know, th firstly, this industry has to advocate for themselves. Nobody else is going to do it for you. Um, so you have to know it and you have to be, you know, I lay my head on my pillow at night and I'm pretty proud of what I do. And I think more executives in this business need to be doing the same thing because the people that work in the industry are pretty proud of it as well. Um, and so I do get very frustrated when I hear the CEOs being apologetic about what they do and the people in the industry being very passionate about what they do. So I think the folks have to know what it is um, and you just can't spout off and be, be angry about, you know, trying solar panels. You have to actually know this stuff. And, and I think explaining to people, you know, understanding where our energy comes from is huge. I mean, I was literally just at the dentist and they're asking me about, you know, this natural gas stuff. People don't understand, you know, what's actually going on within Russia and, and Europe. And so that education, I think, is huge and, and understanding what we use um, and where we're actually going as an economy. And also that, that you know, to um, many people who are obviously on the promotion of natural gas, it is cleaner um, from an emissions standpoint and a pollution standpoint is cleaner than coal, except 
you know, if you can't build a pipeline, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, and so, and there's a lot of issues with pipelines that have not much to do with CO2, they're more not in my backyard types of things and massive anti-oil and gas movements. So I'm not saying, energy, I, I'm not saying education will solve this problem, but it is a, it is one step in the right direction and it's a bare minimum that this industry has to, um, one, advocate for themselves, and two, um, you can't duck and cover, which the industry has, you know, my whole life I grew up around production, um, and, you know, whether it's Exxon Valdez or Deepwater Horizon and, and oil spill, it was a duck and cover. No, it, this industry, and, and, then, and then fracking. We didn't face it head on and explain, hey, here's what's done wrong, and here's why we are going to do it right. Explaining to people how it can go bad and why we're not gonna do that again, or how we fix that, or why it, it's not, you know, fracking is safe. Um, and then what we do now, it, that's really critical, but the industry didn't do that. They just said it's safe. Um, and then you sort of, you know, you allow all these interests. And, and China and Russia are heavily involved in this. I mean, Russia paid for and promoted the anti-fracking movement in Europe. And China um, is, is really, really promoting, you know, climate, the issues around climate change. The International Energy Agency sat down with China um, several, a few months ago, and they agreed to not work on climate change on solving it, but to promote it as an issue. Um, so as long as they, they'll promote it as an issue and they'll talk about it and they'll make this a big deal, and then China will continue to sell the wind and solar panels um, mm -hmm. to all of us. And you know this big thing, uh, the COP program going on and all these G20 and all the meetings taking place right now, a lot of this last week, the focus was on getting Africa and these developing countries, getting them access to, to, to clean and green energy. Well, that clean and green energy they want, uh, that comes from China and that's paid for by, they want 100 billion from developed countries like the US and Europe to write a check to these countries to go buy the wind and solar panel from China. So of course, if I'm China, I'm, I mean, I'm, sol I'm creating the problem, I'm promoting, I'm, you know, have more emissions than anyone in the entire world with coal, and I'm selling the solution. So it's a win-win-win, which they say a lot in their terminology. It works out perfectly for them. It doesn't work out perfectly for the rest of the world. And it has, is not, we're not reducing CO2 emissions. You mentioned you had the conversation at the dentist. What did that look like? I mean, did you call it down to just two or three bullet points, or how did you, how did you convey that education? Uh, well, you know, it started off with inflation because they, and, and not being able to hire people because the dentist, the actual dentist was the one cleaning my teeth as opposed to having a, an assistant clean my teeth. And, um, and I, you know, they were just like, yeah, this is a problem. And then they asked me what I, you know, they knew I travel for work and stuff. So they asked me a little bit about what, what I did and I was explaining it to them. And, and then they were like, yeah, so this is wonderful. The dentist is like in your mouth asking you questions. Um, <laughs> that was part of the yeah. visual I was trying to grasp. <laughs> so the, she's like, yeah, you know, I just had a conversation with somebody about, you know, natural gas issues in Russia. And, and, and I think she said something like, you know, it's, it, it seems more complicated and, you know, so they don't have enough natural gas, so what, they just build a pipeline? And I was like, actually, they had the pipeline. So, you know, something is like they have the pipeline. No, they're, they're not producing enough. Um, and so they're not producing it themselves. And, and I think this, something that this, um, and it's very sad, it's not a good thing, but like the world has to realize, um, and this is, it is energy literacy, it is um, production and consumption. What do we consume? What do we produce? Um, and so you can, you know, we can, we can talk about going green all day long, um, but the feasibility of that is just not happening. So you're not going to win over on, on, on the, the, the sides. That's, that's not the battle you're fighting. But we live in this world today where we're consuming natural gas and oil and we're dealing with the prices that we, we pay for. So I think that basic knowledge of, okay, you know, Europe is, is consuming gas, but they're not producing gas. And so they're, and they're getting it from Russia. So now where do they have to get it from? They're getting a decent amount from us from LNG, um, but all the storage that they had was, was, from, was from Russia. So now we're gonna have, you know, come, they're having a pretty nice calm winter right now in terms of weather, um, unseasonably warm fall. We've, we've seen that in the East Coast as well. Um, so we'll see how that, that comes in. So I think it's, it's having those conversations and, and distilling it down and I mean, I basically, I, I didn't get much out of my mouth because I had hands in my mouth, but I was just saying, you know, yeah, that's what I do. And, and this is, you can't just build a pipeline. Um, it's a, a lot more complicated than that. Um, my Uber drivers all become listeners to the podcast because, you know, they say like, what do you do? And that I'm riding in a Tesla and we talk about that and the, the whole thing. And, and it's usually a very, uh, I get usually a handshake by the end of the ride and, you know, tell me about your podcast. And these are people who we, you know, would not probably agree on many things, but the stuff that, you know, them filling up their tank or them plugging in their vehicle, um, this all matters. And I would say it also matters significantly now because electricity prices are going up and we had pretty stable prices. And now that, you know, people are paying for, if we were all buy a green vehicle today 
and we all plugged it into our houses at night, the grid would just break. I mean, we just wouldn't have the power. So that's a, it's a really serious issue. Um, that's why I say, you know, it's not happening because it's actually not happening. The system isn't created and, and built for this. And it's, it's not to rip on the industry, but it's the data points tell you that only 3% of, and it might, sorry, it might have increased slightly in 2021, but coal production and coal power fire generation increased massively in 2021. Um, so wind and solar power generation is like 6% total of total power generation in the entire world. That's not an energy transition, just full stop, it's not. Um, so that's uh, when, you, when people talk about this of where it's coming from, and then, you know, if the sun doesn't shine, we don't get enough you know, power. If, if we don't get enough rain, we don't get enough um, hydropower. If we don't get enough wind, we don't get enough wind power. And those are really serious, really serious things. Um, and that's where that energy security, and I think this comes back to your question on those traded volumes. I mean, um, just, just where we started, it was about, it was fall of last, of 2021, when this energy security crisis started, was when we saw oil prices jump up to $80 a barrel. That was when um, people started switching out in Europe natural gas to power, natural gas out of the power, and they started burning diesel. And that was when, and that started the diesel problem that we're having. Um, and it also started, I mean, just oil prices going up. And so this dislocated everything. So we're in such a unique environment in terms of the oil market. Um, and it's there's a gazillion moving parts. Um, and you do have to look at FedEx and Walmart and Target to understand where the economy is going. And you do have to follow, you know, actual production and you do have to know what's going on in other parts of the world. And I can tell you, um, it's exhausting. There's a, there's a lot going on in there. Um, so all these moving parts and, and then you have to be able to explain it and help people make good business decisions with it. And it feels scary a lot of times. I'm going to give a lot of presentations and everybody's like, oh, this is just awful. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing. Good. But it's actually knowledge is power. And, um, and so the more you understand this, the more you can actually help with business decisions, whether you're inside oil and gas or you're outside oil and gas, all businesses are connected to it. And so it's, it's being able to you know, understand this stuff and, and know what impacts your business and then making the right decisions. And there will be opportunities. Um, there will be opportunities you know, in and outside the oil and gas industry as this economy backslides, which, which it already is. Um, and this industry is probably poised to be okay in this recession. I mean, we could see oil prices greater, that could happen. I mean, we have volatility everywhere, um, but we're probably going to see some pretty you know, healthy levels. And that means that this industry can also, um, and this is an opportunity for this industry. If other people are letting jobs, you know, letting go, and this industry is hiring, and that is already happening. I'm seeing people move from tech and they're moving into the oil and gas business. That's huge. Um, and so that, that's a way to educate people and also understand that this business is hiring. And you know, when we have a shortage of truck drivers, if we're buying less stuff on Amazon and we don't need the FedEx drivers and they're furloughing people at FedEx right now, um, then that means more truck drivers for the oil and gas business and the frack sand space. That means that you're gonna be less tight on that side. That means that when you're fracking your well, the guy's probably not gonna quit. And if unemployment goes up, they're gonna be a little worried about quitting. Um, so we're gonna, that will get back in line. That will ha that's across all businesses. You know, wind, solar, to dentistry, to everything is, as that uh, unemployment rises, which I know people don't think is a good thing, but it brings things back into balance of the, you know, how many people are applying versus how many people are getting jobs. So yeah, the knowledge is key is, is a good way to think about, feels overwhelming, knowledge is key uh, towards helping with that. Um, Jay, you had a question? Yeah, I was with a group of uh, private equity guys last week. Mm -hmm. and it seems like each one of them has kind of had their fill of ESG rhetoric and wanted to do some pushback. They had questions about nuclear as being fully green. Uh, didn't really know where that was going, but these guys seem very willing to invest more in the oil and gas uh, space than they have in the past two years simply because of that. And, uh, and then the, the comment, maybe you can talk about nuclear, and then one of the things that came off of that was that the uh, hypocrisy coming out of Europe, especially Germany, um, they actually talked about reclassifying LNG as green. Have you heard anything about those types of things? <laughs> Yes, all those. And those are great, uh, great questions and, and really good points um, and good stuff to hit on. Uh, so it wasn't not even two years ago that France wanted to call, um, they wanted to call gas fossil gas. So not natural gas, they want to call it fossil gas. Um, and I'm, I'm very passionate. I do not call this, fo it's not fossil fuels. I don't, I, I really don't like the term. It is crude oil and natural gas, petroleum, it's coal. 
um, and it's energy security, but it is, you know, calling it fossil fuels d does, helps no one. Um, it's also not technically, I mean, we can get into technicalities of that, <laughs> um, but anyways, it's, it, they have negative connotations, just like fracking with a K. Um, so I think, I mean, that was France two years ago. And even a year ago, um, you know, I was presenting to the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies a year ago, and I was getting some feedback on, you know, your very dirty crude oil. And I thought this was a year ago um, of, of no one's going to want your crude oil. Well, they really want our crude oil because we're, we're exporting it at times, you know, over 5 million barrels per day. And that natural gas, um, so that... Germany and France and, and Europe have changed the terminology because they, they were trying to demonize and, and natural gas to try to, to force, they basically were trying to force you know, regulations to, to change this. The problem is doing the same thing the Biden administration is trying to do, which they should clearly see this didn't work, um, is that just because you're anti your production or you're anti it doesn't actually change the behavior unless you're changing the consumption behavior. They can't do that because they would destroy their economies. Um, so I would say I'm, I'm not happy with Europe right now because um, they are not, they're still not signing long-term LNG contracts. And that makes it very difficult for folks in the US on the liquefied, on the LNG business to actually FID projects, to actually get these through final investment decisions. Um, and so we need them permitted first, and we need the effort, we need all these things to come together. And you have to have, you have to have financing and backing. And the only way you have that is if you have, or you're looking at the environment, and you're saying this is pretty secure, just like, operations and production. If you think that the industry is gonna put a windfall tax on you, or if you have too much profits that you're gonna get in trouble, um, if you drill more and you produce more and you have too many profits, then you're gonna get taxed. Same thing for this. Um, there has to be a stable environment here. And so for as much talk as we hear about LNG, we haven't seen that, the signing of long-term contracts. And that's because that Europe thinks that they're still gonna go, they still have their big plans to go green. Um, they also thought they were gonna to continue to get that natural gas from Russia up until that Nord Stream 1 was sabotaged. Um, so they, they thought, I think, that, hey, in a couple of years or whenever this war will end, we'll just get this gas from Russia and we'll just kind of make this, this, no one will talk about this anymore and it'll be just fine. I think that's pretty clear that if, if Olaf Scholz is going to uh, China and, and you know, saying business is most important above everything else, even though this is Europe who should have, you know, are supposedly democracies and bastions of human rights um, to, to kind of begging China, it's, it's a very, very bad look. Um, nuclear is really problematic because, and this, this gets in the fragmentation of Europe. This is not the United States of Europe. This is a very different countries, different cultural, you know, everything. Um, they have their own political issues. They have their own cultural issues. They have a standard currency, but that's not, there's not much that holds them together. Um, and so France has historically nuclear power, obviously Fukushima um, in 2011 um, happened in, in Japan and everyone went anti-nuclear because they were afraid of it. And it is pretty green in terms of an emission standpoint. You know, at what you do with, with the spent, what you do with the waste is important to think about. Um, that water is still important. Um, I'm not anti-nuclear. Um, I'm just saying there, there's, if you, the people that are very pro-nuclear, there's still issues with it. I think the micro reactors are very interesting. I think the technology on it. But truthfully, if you were, if it was all about going green, it would all be nuclear. But you have a lot of people who are anti-nuclear, so you have a lot of interest groups and everything. Um, France is is a lot of nuclear reactors that were going to go offline in in Europe are not going offline. They're extending them now. Um, Coal-fired power plants that were dormant or mothballed are coming back in in you know like crazy. Um, that's pretty that's pretty significant no one's talking about that i think they've had to change and tone down the anti you know fossil rhetoric on on gas particularly because they're just consuming it and they need to be able to buy it from from the us and from other countries we are seeing we are seeing france and germany and other countries really double down in the middle east with qatar i you know it, getting in bed with any country who is not uh does not have your you know doesn't have the same rule of law. Forget even democracy and values, and that's a serious issue, but rule of law is really serious. Transparency and rule of law is incredibly serious. So, you know, us doing business with Canada is great. We should have built Keystone Excel, you know, absolutely. But because that, I mean, it was a signal and everything, but it's like, we know what the regulatory environment is in Canada. Now they can change it, but we, we know they have rule of law um, and we can handle that. We speak the same language, we're right here. Um, you need to be, so for France to double, these countries doubling down in Qatar, you know, yeah, they're gonna get their volumes of what they need, maybe, but if there's a war or something, or, you know, volatility, it, it's not, you're, nothing's certain. And this, if this war has taught us nothing, it's 
it should be teaching us that nothing is certain. Those those volumes were contracted, and yet they're not flowing. So um, you know we we need we need to take that very seriously in terms of what that means. Did I answer that? Okay, those are great, good good points and questions. And sorry, the ESG thing. I'll just add from private equity. I think we were starting to shoot, see as inflation was beginning to really hit and people in the investment space saw that, people were already starting to move back into oil and gas. Anybody that you know has to give an honest answer to their uh, the portfolio's investors knew that oil is kind of an inflationary hedge, so you naturally do that. Um, and people like to make money. So people can feel want to feel good about all themselves, but Vanguard, State Street, BlackRock, they're all heavily invested in China. They're all heavily invested in human rights abuses, in coal. So, and those are ESG funds, um, which massive exposure to China and the province of Xinjiang. Um, so that's low, just absolute BS um, in terms of the ESG funds. Um, and it's all about the E and not about the S and the G. But in terms of the actual move, I, I do think it's really slipping. Um, we are seeing, I think, big money, the, the biggest money, the, the very top down, it's it's just it's not making money, and at the end of the day, you do have to make money. So you know, if my if I was advising wind or solar to anything, it'd be you have to build it in a democratic country, you have to process it in a democratic country, it has to be done under rule of law, and it has to be economical. That's something that you know the oil and gas industry, you know, in many industries we have to do. We have to function in a profitable world, and we get penalized, you know, by shareholders. And it's a commodity business, and it's very difficult. And businesses sort of have to function. And yes, you get there's tax incentives and different things that can happen, but you know that's a reality. So I I think it's shifting. I think it's painful and it's long. Um, but the more education and actually the people speaking out and um, and public companies, as, as you start seeing public operators. You know, shift a little bit. Uh, it, that that's also moving the needle. Great, thank you, um, Rhonda. You had a question. I just I wanted. I've been following Trisha for a while, for years. Like I've watched I've watched her at conferences. <laughs> I just want to look inside her mind and like, how do you organize yourself when you do your research and keep track? Is it something that you lately just remember when you're researching? And I know you sit and you'll read these like. Senate bills and everything else and like do you take notes do you like how do you organize and keep track of everything because the energy industry and it's just so complicated and people don't understand that but you seem to be able to take everything from the different pieces and put them together so I'm just curious inside your mind <laughs> um so I am inherently nerdy as the name suggests um and uh, the and it's it's great to love what you do um so i'd say that that's huge and it, i'm not it is it is hard um my office is a mess um so i can say i have paper stacked up. i have a problem with like i need to like print it out to remember it and then i need to throw away the paper but i can't feel like i should because what if i need to come back to it um the podcast doesn't help with that because i haven't found a fluid way to like capture stuff um i it's taken me years to sort of get to this point of the of studying and figure things out. I had some really, really great professors, and I still have some very good people that I work for in different entities that are pretty good Socratic teachers. They can sort of ask the right questions, you know, very, you know, holistic questions and um, the ability to, so I, I mean, I tell this to my clients, but it's, I have a very no stone unturned approach, um, which is that if you don't have, if I can't answer your question, then it's a really good question um, and we'll figure that out. And as I was, you know, entering this business, you know, as my, my dad pumped oil wells, my grandfather pumped oil wells, so on the labor side, and I was entering it from, you know, going to college and realized that, you know, there was an immense amount of everything, that it's all interconnected and I can study it, I can figure this out. And I had to self-teach myself enough engineering and, and basic engineering in like geology to really understand, you know, where's the Bakken produced? How does it produce? Why does the type of crude actually matter? And, and these things really were exciting to me because they did actually matter. Um, so I just would spend time with a lot of folks, go up to North Dakota, you know, take the rock jock classes for five hours, being the only non-geologist doing that, and asking questions. And they're like, what do you mean you don't know what an anhydrite is? Um, you know, that's, I didn't know what an anhydrite was. Um, still don't really know what that technically is. So it's a blob in there. Um, but I still learned a ton because, um, and that was great because I, you know, people are really kind in this business. They're really kind of in most businesses when you're asking good questions. So I started out asking a ton of questions and being front row kid always up in the front with my hand raised um, and realized that, you know, so 
you collect a lot of that and you have a good basis for you know understanding it and then it just it becomes a lot easier in terms of what you need to know and i would say and uh very fortunate that you know i had a macroeconomic education and some really good professors you know in undergrad and, and grad school and that type of research and work uh, was painful back then um, but it really helped a ton in terms of how like you pulling information um, and so uh, I had a good professor who you know made us read everything and it was brutal I mean it would be 20 articles uh, on from the Economist the Wall Street Journal and then the textbook and I thought I can't I just can't get this done but I realized that that was sort of it, right? It's the marrying of you know the basic textbook knowledge, calling BS on it if that's real, and and the actual data from you know articles and stuff, and and so it's a primary sources are the single biggest thing um, that I do is that articles and stuff are great, but I don't want the if the article tells me that you know the New York Fed just came out with a you know what credit card delinquencies are, I want the New York Fed's credit card delinquency. That's what I want to see, um, and that is. Those data points are really powerful when you're looking at that and then you're listening to the earnings calls of Walmart and Target because all those start adding up of that, okay, well, these consumers aren't doing very well and these delinquencies are going up. And, and so I would say the data is always there. It's the ability to sort of connect the dots. Um, and no, I'm not great at you know keeping it perfectly, you know, keeping, I have messy pages. The notebooks are big, I like those. Um, and I do keep those like a every day, you know, jotting stuff down. Um, and then it's having, uh, I have a great uh, uh, individual who helps me with the data. Um, he's amazing. Um, he's with York, York Data Arts and um, he helps a ton from helping me get things on Spotfire and, and cleaning it up so I can, I can present it. But a lot of it's just, um, and it's spending time with companies and clients. Um, and it's taking years to really, you know, get, getting much better at that working with executives and, and engineers and, you know, what are the questions, what are the problems, and I, I call it, um, it's CEO speak, and it's, I call them the, like the money charts of like, you know, converging a multiple different data points into one beautiful slide that seems very simplistic, um, but it gives that CEO all the answers they need to a question that they didn't even know they had. And um, that's the, like, that's like, what I like to do, um, and I, I enjoy it. So um, the more studying and the more putting it together, and people's and good questions. It's when I get stumped. That's the that's the greatest thing. Um, and so I, I had a question from a, a client recently about the you know the uh, crude being out of whack and the traded volumes, and that sent me off on a whole thing of of looking at that. And now I'm stuck on it, and now it's my thing. Um, so you know those good questions are and those those types of people and and businesses are are sort of what drive it. That's probably I didn't probably answer that very well. So you I'll did, just, you did. okay. Notebooks, and papers. <laughs> yeah. Printing questions. and re reading yeah. primary sources. Primary sources. Yeah. Yep. What is it about this work that does really drive you to do to to provide this sort of consulting services? What what are you what are you giving that you're so passionate about? In your own words it's uh making a difference um and not you know i don't get credit for it a lot for for many of my clients are not publicly known and and uh but i i get to do amazing work on china and geopolitics for certain entities and i'm very passionate about it and i love it um and you know it makes uh you know i go completely in the weeds for weeks and go dark for on, on china stuff and you know I, I it does funnel back to this actually work on, on oil and gas production in the US, oddly enough, it's, it actually is, is connected in different ways. Um, but it's that, uh, I think it's still like the, the a, I'm an A plus student, you know, so I, I still like the, you know, when I can go to a client and I can, I always tell people, I, you know, I'm not gonna make you millions. Um, I'm not gonna promise to do that, um, but I can promise I will save you millions. And um, it may take a bit to see that, but like, you know, if you can invest a little bit, a little bit of time and money in me, you know, the, you know, you being six months out of your peers. And so my clients are, you know, literally six to nine to 12 months. They, they've known all the stuff that's happening right now from a recessionary standpoint, from where housing's going. They knew that in January uh, because I was telling them that. And they might be a little resistant to it, but I, I can now, every quarter I can say, okay, remember when I told you this, okay? And then, and it's, it's a lot easier. So repetition is huge I, I, with, with clients and people and, and everything and, and um, I love to learn, um, and I think that that you know I know we can always do better, and I think that education is just huge, um, and so you know educating people and helping, and that knowledge is power is it is absolutely huge, and you can solve you know studying all this stuff there you can just we can solve a lot of problems, you know by connecting dots and dissecting this and and you know so when people say oh we just can't do this it's like 
Actually, I'm pretty sure we can. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, let's if we can't, let's figure it out. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's and and I would say, I mean, quite honestly, from a business standpoint, it took years to get to this point. You, I get, I still get rejected a ton. I get a lot of no's, and that's always painful. Um, but also going through, you know, losing a job um, and in in the business and choose exploration, loving that work, um, but losing that during the downturn. And um, which is just a reality. A lot of people, I'm sure, in this room lost jobs in 2020 as well. Um, and having my business, and then doubling down on my business, and um, you know, having at no clients at one point, zero, and doubling down on it anyway. And then just uh, that helps a ton. Realizing that you no, know, as bad as it gets, the harder you work, you can work your way through it. Um, so I think the experiences of, and I failed plenty. I mean, those experiences of failure, working your way through it, it helps a ton. Looking in, I mean, I'm. And we're going to be going into recession and it's, you know, it can create anxiety, but also knowing that, you know, the harder you work, you can make it through. That having, that being an entrepreneur and yeah. being in control of that, I get that. Um, I know we are coming down to our time is, is about up. Um, where does your confidence come from? Am I going to stump you on that one? No, I mean, it's a, uh, <laughs> like, like, is it, so if you, you have a strong presence, um, you know, when I first heard you, I was kind of like deer in headlights, you know, and I, I, you probably get that often. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a confidence and, um, I'm just curious, was it something you kind of always had? Is it, have you had to teach yourself it? Did you have insecurities that you had to overcome being in the oil and gas industry? Did you already know about them because you are third generation with your family? I'm um, curious if you could share some more about that. Oh, those are good questions. Um, so firstly, it, it's really humbling to be around great people and people to say that stuff. So that's awesome. Um, I think I I would say confidence is not natural. I'm, I'm the baby of three girls. Um, so I, I always tell people I didn't, I wasn't born with the embarrassment gene. Um, so I just don't get embarrassed very easily. So always from being little of, you know, I can't dance, but I'll go dance in front of people. Um, I can't, you know, I, I, and I've never been shy of like, you know, asking for the, you know, speaking out. I've just, I've not, I haven't been shy. I had some severe learning issues when I was little because I couldn't see or hear um, and didn't know my ABCs. So I was probably five, couldn't read until I was in second or third grade. Um, so that probably was a bit of, uh, I was, I was anxious to sort of get, you know, catch up and get ahead and, and loved uh, books, but I couldn't actually read them. And so, but I never had an issue of speaking out. Um, I just never, I always, I, 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 and I'm the baby, so maybe I, and maybe because of disabilities, I wanted to get heard. Um, but being the youngest too, you just, I, you just, my older sisters were embarrassed to do stuff and I was not. Um, and I couldn't sing either, but I would, you know, I'd sing at our Christmas things that we had with my grandfather. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't carry a tune, but I would memorize all the words and so it's, sad um just know, knowing all the words <laughs> in your head and, and can't get the tune out at, at all like completely tone deaf um so i would say it's it's not and i know people say like uh you know the fake it till you make it um i, I have insecurity issues. everybody has you know the things that they worry about or concerned about or anything um and certainly i mean uh i i want to you know i'm a serial entrepreneur i'll have multiple businesses i would like to have a bigger you know big businesses and people under me and people would say oh just you know you haven't managed people and i would say it's not this industry it's everything you always have somebody always saying well you, what is the thing you know you haven't done this and you haven't done this and you haven't done this um and it's like okay well yeah and i'll do them someday you know you know we will get there you and until you have so you just do it exactly and and that's i think one of the biggest things people always are are so like well i don't have experience in this well most people that sort of like charge ahead, never had experience in that stuff before, they just go do it. Um, and so I say that that go doing attitude, my my dad always said I uh, just grab the bull by the horns and just r run with it. And I think being a being a kid from Northwest Colorado, Wyoming, I was pretty shy I mean, in terms of just, I didn't, I was, with, wasn't ready to leave home with college. And then once I got there and realized, well, I'm, I've already left home, so, and Denver was a huge city, then it was sort of like, well, I want to do everything. I want to just experience everything. And I was on scholarship, so I really wanted to get every dime, you know, everything I could out of my education. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I had a lot of, I mean, I, I thanked Bill, Governor Bill Owens because I was on the governor, or Governor's Opportunity Scholarship. And um, he told me, he, there's so many people that come up to him 
literally on the street and and you know say thank you for like these opportunities um and a lecture a lot of kids like a lot of kids from rural colorado got these scholarships and it was interesting it reduced because you could see it these kids were just hard working and there was a difference between and i don't want to say a difference but scholarship kids often you know know what they've been given and this is a huge opportunity so i double majored and i minored um and um you know so i, I just get, getting everything out that I can and I would say and also I feel that for people if you're in this room and you sat here today you took your time out and that's something like you know you're giving me your time which is huge and I for clients as well and so I literally just gave a presentation in Pittsburgh and I had these two young men in the back laughing at me because the presentation started at 3 30 and we're edging on five and I'm in the weeds and they're laughing and I was like what the hell are you laughing about and they were like we just had a bet on how many slides and uh, and I was like, I told, I don't tell, I don't say up front how many slides, but I say, look, you came in here, you paid me for this, you know, you're in here and you're paying me, and so I'm gonna give you your bang for your buck, and I don't shortchange people, and so there's just a mentality on, I guess, and doing what's right too. Awesome, awesome. All right, last question. Um, when you're not uh, recording Petro Nerds podcast or speaking at events like this, what? What else is Trisha Kidder stirring with her spare time? What can we find you doing here in Colorado or traveling? Like having a life? Yeah, a life. <laughs> that side of things. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, not in the weeds. I'm not great at, at, at having a life. Um, no, I, I do. Uh, so I have a, um, my boyfriend works at Liberty Energy. Um, so, you know, we, we nerd out plenty. We, our dinner conversations are geopolitics and, and things like that. So that's great. Um, I like fire, like my fire pit, I'm a fire bug. Um, so I have a fire pit in my backyard. I have a German shepherd. Um, and you know, he's my baby and you know, where, where I go, he goes. Okay. Um, so, but you know, be, being born and raised in Northwest Colorado, I, I'll admittedly say I, I don't ski. Um, so I've not, you know, I'm not going to the mountains every weekend to do that. And I, my family is, uh, you know, hugely important to me. So my free time, you know, if it's not, you know, if it's not carving out time on relationship stuff and, and, you know, managing, cause he travels a lot too, managing that, managing all of that, it's, uh, spending time with my family. And, um, and I think the last few years have taught me that I, you work really hard so you can carve out that time to, to be with your family. So my, I have, you know, th three nieces and a nephew and they're amazing. And so. Uh, my family is extremely important to me, and that's uh, yeah. So fire pits uh, and and family and German shepherds, German shepherds and boyfriend, <laughs> young boyfriend. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Trisha. Um, any other final questions? All right. Well, thank you, Trisha. Thank you. It's Appreciate been awesome. It. Yeah.